So first of all, welcome to Uncle Astle. Um, and can I first of all say thank you very much for doing the Learners Lecture this evening, which I think has gone down incredibly well. But to actually give us a little bit more background, could you perhaps just introduce yourself and explain some of your highlights of your career? Gosh, yeah. Well, firstly, thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to do. Um, so I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and I work in Cambridge at the Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. And in our lab, we are really interested in how children learn and in particular why different children might struggle at school. And we study cognition, so different skills like attention and memory and language. And we also study children's brains. And then we try and piece all of those things together to try and understand how the brain changes as kids get older and how that's related to how their cognition changes and how well they do at school. And so that's our kind of broad area of interest. So we spend quite a lot of time, um, not just with scientists, but with teachers and people who spend time with kids. Um, and hopefully our findings have some relevance to their practice. And what was this thing that sparked your interest in particularly cognitive science generally, but specifically in terms of the struggling learner? Gosh. Well, I first studied psychology at, at, at university and I just really enjoyed it. I just, it's such a fascinating subject. And then I did a neurosciences PhD, and that gave me a really kind of broad training. But it wasn't until after that that I started to really get interested in childhood and in development. Um, because we kind of see the adults kind of this end result. But in reality, there have been so many different factors that might be really important in the development of that individual. And I started to want, ask all sorts of questions about how the brain might change over time. And that's essentially what really inspired me then to start thinking about development and then how and when development might go awry. So why some children might struggle. And from the talk that you've given this evening on the struggling learner, it strikes me that it's a fairly significant shift in thinking in these terms. Would you agree or not? Yeah, I, no, I would agree. So there's, in the last few years, there's been a real push towards what we refer to sometimes as a trans-diagnostic approach to thinking about developmental disorders and struggling learners. And the reason we think it might be important is because lots of children who have different diagnoses might have very similar problems. And the flip side is that lots of children who have the same diagnosis or the same label might have very different problems. And so what we've tried to do is take a step down from looking at the labels themselves um, to looking at the underlying skills that we think might contribute more directly to the specific difficulties that they're having. And that has been a shift that you see in sort of adult psychiatry, and I guess we're trying to bring it to developmental disorders and struggling learners. So, and that has been really informative in our thinking, and hopefully it's an idea that is starting to gain traction in the wider research field. Has anything that you, that's come up surprised you? Yes. One thing that really surprised me is that you can have children who present with very similar learning difficulties or challenges, but that they arrive at them from very different routes. So that has really surprised me. That whilst we can separate those children out in terms of their cognitive skills, the end result for a teacher in the class might look very, very similar. And that seems to me to be really crucial because it might influence how you try and support that child. Um, and I think that's something that's a little bit counterintuitive, but that seems very important. And so what do you see as the next stages of development from a, a research point of view, particularly in terms of taking these ideas forward and perhaps providing more evidence that would be useful to be looked at from a classroom perspective? So a really critical piece of missing evidence at the minute is longitudinal data, right? So we've looked at this really large sample of kids who were struggling in school, and it would be really important to follow those kids up. So we're now starting the follow-up. So we're seeing all the children five years after we originally saw them. So in the, in the, in the next two or three years, we will re-see all of the kids. And it's gonna be incredibly interesting to try and understand how, what changes have gone on in that time. Are there children who have amazingly caught up? And if so, how and why? Are there children who have drifted further behind? 
and if so, how and why. So I think that longitudinal data, so we can track the same individual children as they grow up, is probably the next really crucial piece of evidence that we need to build. And obviously, the evidence you get from the research is really useful and valuable and important. I guess the next question is the area that Learnus is particularly sort of focused on, is how do you manage to translate that into what it might mean in the classroom? We spend a lot of time going around to schools, speaking with teachers, doing inset training days for teachers. And that's usually our main source of inspiration surrounding those, that, that translational element. So we recently published an article in the Times Education Supplement, which was really the kind of culmination of our kind of scientific research and also our thinking, our evolving thinking, about how this might play out in the real world. So I would say that that translational process has to happen hand in hand with the teachers and the practitioners that spend time with the kids. So for example, every year we always have a practitioner workshop where we try and spend time with practitioners to hear about questions that they're interested in that we can help them answer and vice versa. So I think that we work hard on that translational element and we do it by working essentially hand in hand with the teachers. And so what advice would you give us learners as to about how we could improve that process, that connection, in order that would help and benefit both researchers and teachers? Something that would be really good is, is something like a focus group where you get to spend some time with specialist teachers kind of in small groups to try and identify key areas of need that, where more research is needed. Because often as researchers, we kind of go off and study something that we think is super duper interesting, but that has no practical value for teachers. And I think making sure that teachers are more, more firmly involved in the research process from the start. So traditionally, we think about translation of, you know what, we do the science, and then we go and tell some teachers about it. Whereas actually, translation needs to start right at the beginning. So getting teachers involved in the designs of studies and the designs of analysis and the kinds of questions that are being asked. I think that's a really key step. And that's the kind of thing that an organization like Learners can be a massive help in doing. You know, that's quite interesting because you don't know that we're already thinking in those terms. I don't know that. So I'm going to drop you in it and say, would you be interested if we approached you to oh, be part of that process? Absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, those opportunities are really rare, but incredibly valuable. So if there are more opportunities for that, we can actually make that then happen. we'd be really grateful. Yeah. So one last message. What message would you give for the future of this sort of research that really we need to aim for? Gosh, that's a big question. When I give talks like this to, to practitioners and I say to them, the labels that children come with don't really do a good job of capturing the kinds of problems that they have. They all kind of nod their heads sagely because they've known that for years. And it kind of encourages me that actually lots of teachers kind of experience and intuitions about children and why they might be struggling is incredibly valid. Um, and actually teachers are highly skeptical when people kind of come in with you know, a, a, a label and a, and, a, and, a, and a treatment and a kind of silver bullet and, I, and for me, one of the big take-home messages is that actually teachers are incredibly receptive to kind of cutting-edge research when it's geared towards asking the questions that they want addressing. Yeah, that's really great and very helpful. And thank you again, once again, for a brilliant lecture. Pleasure. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you.